So why is it that even if the English law was, as you say, Judge Calabresi, that the early evidence of American history, uh, why doesn't the early evidence of American history not suggest that we went another direction? So, question mark. You get Blackstone, I get story. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'm ahead. <laughs> well, I don't know whether I want to take on uh, Blackstone. The, the question uh, John Manning has asked uh, is the subject of an ongoing debate, may, maybe a closed debate, but maybe an ongoing debate between him and Professor Eskridge about what's known as the equity of the statute doctrine. And you can find uh, similar expressions actually in Hamilton's uh, part of the Federalist. What, what I have to say is that I read those expressions as saying roughly what I tried to say in statutes domains, which is that if you read the statute and it does not have an intelligible outcome. You don't try to pick it up and run with it. You just declare that the statute has been exhausted. And there is some fallback position. The fallback position may be a different statute. It may be the presumption of private ordering. But that the equity of the statute doctrine was not then, and certainly isn't now, uh, a transfer of authority to the judges to impute things to Congress. Now. There's, there's a further Philip there, which is that I have a different view from Justice Brandeis about the propriety of federal common law. You may remember what happened early on in our history, that judges who were steeped in Blackstone decided in Swift against Tyson that there was such a thing as a general federal common law. Uh, and it could be used to fill these gaps when state statutes ran out and there was no federal statute. And you may remember in Erie Railroad, which overruled Swift, uh, Justice Brandeis said it was just unconstitutional to think that there could be general federal common law. Uh, and he referred to an article by uh, Professor Warren at, at Harvard uh, who said, well, looky here, general federal common law hasn't met the requirements of bicameralism and presentment and all those other lawmaking things. And the Supreme Court actually said uh, in Erie Railroad that for federal judges to make up things in the nature of common law was unconstitutional. And I must say I'm very skeptical about that. I agree with uh, Judge Calabresi that there is, that such a power can be conferred on the court. You know, I think that's what the antitrust laws did, not for Judge Bork's reason, but for Judge Taft's reason. Mm -hmm. Much In the Addiston Pipe case, Judge Taft worked this through contemporaneously with what they did and thought that's what happened. Essentially, all maritime law is federal common law. That all the uh, law that applies to uh, interstate land disputes is federal common law. Uh, and we increasingly see that in statutes like ERISA, which have effectively preempted all state law for pension plans and told the federal judiciary to make up a common law. So I don't think there's anything illegitimate if a statute passed by both houses, signed by the president, transfers a lawmaking authority to the judges. The, the proposition I was trying to defend, and it's then honest interpretation to carry out that plan, that one should not find that there unless it's been transparently delegated. Um, first, I, I do want to say something about Blackstone because I do think that Blackstone was expressing the view, as best we can, of the framers of the power that uh, judges had over statutes. Uh, and. Uh, it's a dangerous power, but that power was there, uh, and it wasn't just the equity of the statute. It was a question of how you read, whether you read statutes in the way I have said, and I think that the understanding, the original understanding was of that sort. Now, original understanding is always a problem. Uh, if I may tell you an anecdote, uh, I uh, went up to Justice Frankfurter once and said to him, I think that the meaning of the constitutional phrase that you must be a natural born citizen of the United States to be president means that if you are naturally born, that is illegitimate, 
you must be a citizen of the United States to become president. Uh, of course, Frankfurter, like me, was born not in this country. Uh, and I said, and by the way, if you look to the intent, it's perfectly obvious it was to require that Hamilton be an actual citizen because he was illegitimate and they didn't trust him. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was making the caricature of the legislative argument. And Frankfurter uh, wrote me a note which said, I'll buy that. And anyway, it's as good as most of what goes for history in this court. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a danger in that. Now, interestingly, Story said there is no common, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, John said there was no common law of the no federal common law because there isn't the equivalent of the adoption of the English common law generally at the federal level. That's what Erie, in effect, is relying on. And it's true, the common law of England did not become the law of this independent nation. It became the law of individual states because it was enacted. It became the law of admiralty, admiralty common law. It can become the law under antitrust or other things, but there is no such thing as federal common law at large precisely because it was not enacted. Interestingly, its story, whom John says tells me that statutes have to be read very narrowly, who in Swift v. Tyson tells me there is a federal common law and, and courts can do anything they goddamn please outside of this area. So who the hell is Story? <laughs> Frankly, he isn't Blackstone in terms of the meaning uh, of uh, uh, the things. Uh, I go back to saying Blackstone put it right. There is some very limited power of interpretation as against construction under statutes, which goes beyond text that includes context and other things, and that's what we have to do as honest agents. There is no federal common law because it was not enacted. When it is enacted, as in the antitrust, and I agree with you, by the way, I don't buy Bork's construction. I much prefer the other one. Uh, and uh, there are statutes which enact, give courts the common law power, and understand that when we are given the common law power under ERISA, under antitrust, and so on, then we do a job which is different. We try to do not an unlimited job, but a common law job of articulating the <clears throat> statutes. When instead we act as interpreters of the statute, we are honest agents in the ordinary meaning of that in a situation which is much more difficult than when my secretary tries to understand what I had in mind, although that ain't easy either. <laughs> and a good secretary is somebody who is good and honest at that, and that's a different task. Thank you. Well, it, it sounds as if you two are converging, and so I'd like to try to pull you apart a little bit by asking some hypotheticals. Um, so my first hypothetical is this. Uh, assume that Congress passes the Toxic Control Act of 2009. The Toxic Control Act of 2009 has two sections. Section one, we find that benzene is a known carcinogen with no threshold be below which exposure can be deemed safe. Section two, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration shall protect workers against material impairment of health from benzene by promulgating regulations that limit its exposure to no more than one part per million. Okay, that's 2009. In 2019, scientific evidence shows rock solid that benzene has no carcinogenic properties below 10 parts per million. The statute says one part per million. Does the Occupational Safety and Health Administration have the authority to raise the exposure limit from one to 10 parts per million? Judge Calabresi? I would love to say it did, but don't think so. Uh, 